So that's the way the bureaucratic factor operated, and we had a lot of it in Vietnam. And the reason I got involved with it was because my first job in Vietnam was to be news director. And it was only after I had been there three or four months that the fellow who was doing the morning show left to go back home, and I took it over. Now, before being uh, sent to Vietnam, or actually volunteering for Vietnam, before then, I had spent a year and a half on the island of Crete. Now, if you want to talk about good duty, picture snow-capped mountains, gorgeous beaches, crystal clear water you can see down for hundreds of feet. Even today, it's a mecca for scuba divers. And I had to be on the air there at 6 a.m., and I'd be on the air until 9 or 10, and even then I couldn't leave. Then I'd have to stay around and write copy and do production. So I wouldn't get off until 11 or 12. And I'd go back and eat lunch, go to my room, change into my swim trunks, stop by the club, pick up a six-pack of Lohenbrow, and spend the afternoon on the beach recuperating from my strenuous morning. <laughs> now, if you have to defend your country, that's the place and the way to do it. Um, but I volunteered for Vietnam because I was, uh, when I put my paperwork in, it was 1964. And at that point, we were still a small, what was called an advisory mission in Vietnam. But after my paperwork went in, there was the Gulf of, Ga of Tonkin incident, and Lyndon Johnson started his escalation of the war, and in one year's time, I watched Saigon go from a sleepy little French colonial town to a real nightmare with this massive influx of troops and equipment and money and personnel. And by the time I left, the uh, economy was in ruins, the black market was out of control, the traffic was unmanageable. But at the time I put in my paperwork, none of that had happened yet. So I decided I wanted to go to Vietnam. I'd seen a little bit of the... Uh, of Europe and the Near East, and I wanted to see some of the Far East. I could have gone to Japan, but that was a three-year tour. My enlistment was only uh, four years, and by the time I was through with uh, the island of Crete, that enlistment only had a year left to go, so I could, couldn't go to Japan. Vietnam seemed like the best, next best choice. That was only a year's tour. About three or four weeks after I had put in my paperwork, I was standing in the uh, newsroom watching a story clear on the teletype about how the Viet Cong had just blown up the radio station in Saigon. And I said, whoops. Actually, I said something a little stronger than whoops, but it was uh, too late to worry about it, so off I went. And the station in Vietnam was um, the best equipped, state-of-the-art equipment you could get at the time. The reason is very simple. The Viet Cong every couple of years would blow it all up and we'd have to bring in all brand new equipment. So that was, that was uh, good, good equipment to work with. Now when I was in Greece, I started the morning show and it was just a calm matter of fact. It was, I was at Iraklian Air Station. It was a calm matter of fact. Good morning, Iraklian. But as the program developed and got wilder and wilder, the good morning, Iraklian got wilder and wilder. And uh, so when I went to Vietnam, what was, when I took over the morning show, what was Good Morning Iraklian became Good Morning Vietnam. Uh, let me see, anything else that I need to tell you about? Well, I have taken a lot of pride in Good Morning Vietnam because of the number of people who've come up to me and shaken my hand and quietly said, thank you for helping me get through Nam. And I don't think it gets much more rewarding than that. Also, um, I am uh, impressed by the number of people who come up to me and say, oh, I used to listen to you every morning. Really? When were you there? Oh, I was there in, uh, in 69 and 70. Well, I was there in 65, 66. I just said that, didn't I? Um, but, the, you know... I have also been told by the number of people, by a number of veterans, it's the first film that I began, that, that began to show Americans as they really were, instead of murderers and rapists and baby killers and dope addicts and psychotics. And that's the mythical image today that many people have of Americans in Vietnam. And I can tell you from personal experience, I went out into the field dozens of times. I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of Americans. And you know what? 
I never met a single murderer. I never met a single rapist. I never met a single dope addict. I never met a single psychotic. I never met a single baby killer. What I did meet were a lot of good and honorable men, and women too, who might not have been particularly pleased about where they found themselves, but who were determined to do their duty as well and as professionally as they could. And that's the story that's not being told. And when I speak to my fellow veterans, I always urge them that unless we tell the next generation what was going on, where we were, what we were doing there, why we were there, what are the values that are so important that we were willing to fight for them and even possibly die for them. Unless we tell that to the next generation, they're not going to know. And that's very sad. Because unless they do know, we as a country may fall prey to the prediction of George Santayana, the philosopher, who said those who will not learn from the past are condemned to repeat it. Now that's a very pessimistic uh, formulation, I think it was expressed a little more optimistically by the novelist Herman Wouk, who said, the beginning of the end of war lies in remembrance. And so I urge my fellow veterans always to talk about what we were doing, to tell the next generation and let them know. And to bring the next generation, bring them up, with an appreciation of the values that we fought for and we felt were so important. Things like love of God and love of country and the work ethic and doing, uh, taking pride in a job well done. Ultimately, pride in being an American. And that is so important.